great. If you haven't been there, check it out. We are one of the biggest Judaism websites in the world. It's basically in, in the in the firm belt. It's like uh, it's us and Chabad.org, two very different kinds of websites. And we have about uh, we get about a million visits a month on the English site with English, Hebrew, Spanish, and French. But the English is by far the biggest one. We have articles, videos, uh, infographics on everything: uh, current events, contemporary topics, uh, spirituality, dating, parenting, marriage. Israel, uh, Hagim, Parsha. Basically, our whole approach is take, cast the widest net, talk about the Torah perspective on topics that the non from Jew are, is thinking about. So, quite often, current events is, is a very hot topic, like uh, sexual harassment, what's going on in America today with the Me Too movement. Um, Eric Shabbos is trying to get an article about Black Mirror. You guys know that? Don't tell me that. Okay, but we're trying to get an article on that, like a Jewish perspective on on different issues that, that the series raises. Um, very few people in, in Asia Torah land knew about the series, but one person drew a find and she's writing a piece about it, and that's good. Uh, and we do we, we do videos. We're trying to do new things all the time, and uh, it makes a huge impact. The fact that we're reaching, we get about like seven hundred thousand people come to the site every month. We have uh, 100,000 people on our email list. And the, the site really works according to Noah Feinberg's philosophy that wisdom for living changes people life, people's lives. Right? If you give them inspiring, compelling content that speaks to them, they see this really, I know I this is about Judaism, then they, they want more. And they'll come to the site, and then they'll learn more. Then they start going to the advanced section of the website. We'll hook them up with a, with a phone kavusa. We'll hook them up with a, a local key room organization in their city. And they start becoming firm. And all of it begins by the, by the website. Do we have any questions about ace.com? Do you have to ask anything you want about it before we start the class? Yes. Is it a non-profit? It is a non-profit site, and we struggle financially. If anyone wants to make a half donation, to speak to me after the class. Yeah. Why, you thought it was like a, it's a, it's a moneymaker? No. It's very hard to make money. I mean, we monetize that as much as we can, but it doesn't cover our budget. Any other questions? Yeah? What do you have emails that you send out? We send out, we have uh, our weekly web update, like our, the new content, which ends up being about three, or three emails a week. Then we have segregated lists, you know, if you want spirituality, dating, cooking, society, yeah, Parsha, Parsha beginners, Parsha advance. Those, those are the basic ones. 48 Ways to Wisdom, you get the whole series emailed to you. You know, Jewish history, stuff like that. Okay, check it out. Ready to begin? Okay. Here you see, guys, see these nine dots on the board? Your job is to connect all the dots using four straight lines without lifting up the pen. If you know the answer to this question you've heard before, don't give it away. Okay? Four straight lines without lifting up the pen connects all the dots. You know, you've heard this before? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. You're my fallback. Got it? Yeah? You heard it before? No. Okay, come on down. What's your name? Me, Sammy Bernstein. Sammy Bernstein. Sammy, if you get this right, you should get an extra piece of pizza because it's the fastest that anyone's ever got this. Okay? How many guys think Sammy knows it? I, I think so. Oh. I think I shot it from the title of the sheet. Oh, okay. One. Oh. No, but you without the dip of pen. Oh, so keep going. Okay. One. Uh, but you're on the right track, which is impressive. I didn't really have it the whole, like, lifting up. Okay, but, but wait, wait, okay. Anyone else? Uh, Sammy. Sammy broke through the wall, put it that way. If you think about what he did, it's very gettable. Anyone got it? You know it? Do you remember? Come on down. What's your name? Come, 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 we show you. You think you got it? Make fun of one of us. What's your name? Asher Briggs. What's your name? Asher Briggs. Asher. Asher.
One, two, three, four, up. Oh. You ran out. Okay, one of you guys, come on down. You remember it? Come. Let's see. Okay, you guys watching? One, good, two, three, four. You just have to go a little higher, you just have to go a little higher. One, two, three, four. You see that? What Sammy did was really the right approach. You've got to get outside the box. If you try and stay within this box of the nine dots, it's impossible. Only if you break out of it, one, two, three, four, can you connect all the dots. you got to think outside the box. How are we stuck inside of a box? What are you going to say? How are we stuck inside of a box? Go on, grab a piece of pizza, sit down. Do you want to go? But anyways. Okay. Grab a pizza, sit down. How are we stuck inside of a box? Yeah. We don't really like to, uh, to think. We like to tell what, what to do. We don't like to think. Like people tell us what to do. The rabbis tell us what to do. Okay? That puts us in the box. What else? Yep. How are we products of our environment? Okay, everyone is born in a bubble, right? How, do we, how does that bubble shape us? Can you give more detail to that? Okay, you have been born in a, in a religious home, right? That's your bubble. And at a certain kind of religious home, you're told to go to a certain kind of yeshiva. Do you think that impacts you and shapes who you are? Does that create a box at all? What do you guys think? How so? You just like live your life based on the way you've been told and like don't think about that maybe. What? You you are shaped from birth with a certain set of values, ideas, certain goals that are expected from you, and that's just a given of who you are. And 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 you just stay within that box. You guys have any other examples of people in the box? Other examples? Yep. Sports. How are sports a box? It's really like what everyone else does. Okay, there's a certain social uh, expectation of what kind of sports you can play. Badminton really isn't the thing, right? Right? Okay. Uh, yep. The guy with the 9 to 5 job comes along. Okay, we get people. on a career track and then that limits us. Okay, I want you to watch this video. And tell me what, think about what kind of box this woman is in. The story of a young woman and a dream, and while this story ends well, it is a chilling tale at the same time. That's because this young woman's dream was to become a martyr by killing herself and others. At the center of this story is a young Palestinian woman. She had been given permission to come to Israel for badly needed medical treatment. At some point along the way, she developed another twisted and secret agenda. NBC's Martin Fletcher picks up the story. Until Monday, Wafa al-Bas seemed like an ordinary 21-year-old Palestinian from Gaza. On her way to an Israeli hospital scheduled for more treatment of severe burns from an accident. Doctors liked her, and she liked them. Did you save her life? I believe so, yes. <laughs> After six months treating her, Dr. Yuval Krieger and the nurses even got this thank you note from Waka's family. The care, it says, was wonderful and warm. But then... She didn't come, and Marco was one of the people who didn't show up. It wasn't only the doctors expecting her. At the border with Gaza, soldiers had information a female suicide bomber was on the way. And then Waka shows up with 20 pounds of bombs in her underpants. Soldiers order her to halt and undress. Desperate, Waffa pulls a detonator. She flinches. The moment caught in an army video camera. She expects to die, but no explosion. She tries again. Still, she lives. Furious, she screams in frustration. And the army blew the bomb up safely. If Waffa <coughs> had 
made it, this is where she would have come, the outpatient department of Soroka Hospital. Eight o'clock in the morning, normally there's about a hundred patients here. So what turned one for it was suicide bomber, who used the doctor's appointment to try to kill the doctor. I, I guess that was a target. <laughs> One explanation from Latifa, who met Wafra in the hospital. They talked daily for a month. After her terrible parents, Wafra's fiancé left her. She felt abandoned and ugly. She cried and said, I want to die. She said, someone give me a bomb. Wafra said the bomb came from militants from al brigades. At home in Gaza, her mother cries. My child is sick, and they used her. Now Wafa's crying too. I wanted to be a martyr, but now I want to live, she says. Please forgive me. Don't put me in jail for life. I didn't kill anyone. Mom, that's your NBC. Should we hold her morally accountable for her actions? Is she personally responsible for her actions? What do you guys think? Yeah. Yes. Why? Because at the end of the day, <coughs> even though one could be more knowledgeable, they have to take things into account on their own standard and think about it something. Okay, so you said a few things there. You said even though she may be brainwashed, she should still own up to her actions. Like she has to, she can know, like, she can be told what to do, but at the end of the day, it's her choice to do it. Okay, even though she might be influenced by society, at the end of the day, it's her choice. What's your name? Max. Max. Anyone agree with Max? You guys agree with Max? Yes. Anyone want to amplify what Max was just saying? <coughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, I think it's more than just that. You need to be shown that when you have the accountability for that action, you should be part of Okay, so she has to serve as, a, as an example for society that you just can't get away with this. Okay? But I really want to focus on just her. Like, is she morally responsible? Could she have known better, in other words? So Max says yes. How? What's the side to say you know, it's not so simple? What, why is this a question? What are you guys thinking? That's how she was conditioned. You don't know. You heard so fast. How? Where did she get her ideas from? Her community or society? Her community or society? She lives in Gaza. What did she learn in school? All that she learned was to do this now. That's all she knows. Hate Israeli. Hate Jews. They're usurping our land. Right? Who do they worship in that society? They worship the suicide bombers. Right, the, 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 the Shahid, the suicide day. bombers. They, uh, so she's having a bad day. She wants to be a martyr. What does a martyr give her? That's it. She's a hero. That's it. She's a, she's a tzaddik, you know, that but that, that's what they worship in that society. That is all she knows. She is stuck in that box of gaslighting. Like what Max is saying in the first part, she's completely brainwashed. She's conditioned to think this way. That's all she knows. So if that's the case, why should we hold her more accountable? I agree with what you're saying. We, you can't let her get away. She's a men's society. Of course, you've got to put her in jail. But that doesn't say much about her own personal responsibility. Societally, we've got to deal with her. Individually, is she accountable? If so, why? How do you explain why we should hold her accountable despite her conditioning and her upbringing? Yeah. She was exposed to the other side. How was she exposed to the other side? Okay, very good. What's your name? Joseph. You guys hear Joseph the same? Did she ever break outside her box? Yeah. yeah, she went to the hospital. She met Israelis. The Israeli doctor saved her life. They wrote a whole letter. What should that have done by meeting these Israelis? Should have changed her perception. Or even before change perception. If you even don't want to go that far. What's Question. the step before it? Question. It should have thrown a monkey wrench in her all over me. One second. This doesn't match the way I grew up. This guy isn't the devil. This is goes. This flies against every I'm learning from my parents and my society. It should have at least provoked a question. That is Mahaya for her. That obligates her. Now she has to deal with this question. Am I going to wrestle with this question? How do I know 
that everything I'm learning in my upbringing is right. Maybe I'm being brainwashed in a whole wrong, false ideology. Does that make sense? If she would have never gone to the hospital, could she have broken outside of her box? What do you think? If she never went to the hospital, never went to the hospital, do you think she could have broken free? Possibly. Yeah? How? She had access to the Say that again? If she had access to the She had access, okay. Even today, it's very easy to get access to information. There's very few places in the world where you don't have access to outside information. Right? But, what's the big question about that? What would have compelled you to go look? If you're stuck in the box, that's all you know, why would she go look about other positions? Near? So why? What's really the answer? What do you guys think? Also, yeah. before you do something that affects other people, before you try to hurt other people, you have to really look at your perspective and really make sure that your side is actually right. Why? How would she know to do that? You're right. How would she know to do that? I think that's actually a basic human thing that you have to do. Because what's the most basic human thing that every normal functioning human being is able to do? Think. And where does thinking begin? Questioning. They can realize I'm in a box. She can understand that I am who I am, especially like what you're saying, before I do something so consequential, blow myself up and kill other people, she can realize I am who I am because I'm a product of my society. And therefore, I don't know if I'm right. All my beliefs and attitudes are an accident of birth. If I was born two miles north in Israel, I'd be a completely different kind of person. Right? She has that self-awareness to look outside of herself and see I'm in a box. That obligates her to start to think and to explore other opinions. Do you get that? You have another example of someone who actually did do that? You guys know Yusuf Khanan, the Green Prince, the son of Hamas? This guy was born in Gaza too, in a far worse home. His father was one of the founding fathers of Hamas. Can you imagine being born, born and raised that way? The, 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 the hatred he had for Israel, and he became a terrorist. He went to jail, he was caught by Israel, and in Israel, he started to read the Jerusalem Post. That blew open his box. And he started to think. And in the end, he became a spy for Israel. For 10 years, he was, he was Israel's prize spy until his cover was blown. And he repudiated his father and you know, became you know, the prophet of the son. An amazing thing. Who else is stuck inside of a box besides, you know, terrorists? Who else? Abraham? At the beginning, he was. Why? He was an idol worshiper. His father was an uh, was a was a big uh, idolater, right? His whole world was seeped in idolatry. And what did Avram Avinu do? What made him Avram Avinu? He questioned. Everything. He questioned everything. Even though the whole entire world was against him, can you imagine? There's no internet, right? There's no one to even ask. Because the whole world is thinking one way. It's like being born and raised in communist Russia. And your parents are, you know, card-carrying members of the communist party. You have no internet. And from there, and even from there it's possible, you can say, I don't really buy this. Well, I don't know if I should. Let me think. And you know what? There's a guy named should tell it who is a Chinese Christian, who was a Christian, <coughs> Chinese communist, right? Back in the day where they didn't have internet, he went through this struggle, and he met a Christian minister, and he said, give me your Bible. And that started a whole odyssey, and eventually, because he, he was so blown away by the Bible, he wanted to explore Judaism, went to Toronto, started to learn, he mentioned ended up at Asia Town, Jerusalem, and converted. He was a from Jew, living in Spain today. He was a Chinese guy who didn't know anything. Why? Because he was speaking, he was questioning. That isn't something that just terrorists have to do. That's something that every human being has to do. That's something that we all have to do. 
Because every human being is born and raised and stuck in a box. Because we are who we are by our based on our society and our parents. You can't escape that. That's all of us. Does that make sense? What's wrong with staying inside the box? Especially if you're raised by such fine homes as you guys are all raised in? What's wrong with staying in the box? You can have enough. You can have another reason. Because if you're staying in the box, you are a zombie. You're a robotic. You are just part of the masses going along with the herd. Your herd might be, you know, other yeshiva brothers, the religious community. But is that sufficient? Is that enough of a reason to be thrown? It means that that's the only reason why you're thrown. Are you really any different than this woman? You're both prone to your society. You have been born in the sun, she was born in that society. And if you're born in a Christian home, you'd be a good believing Christian. It means your whole mahout, your whole essence, is just an accident. It's a scary thought. It means it has no basis. It's not real. You have no idea if what you believe is really true. And you're affected by what your society tells you. But it's even worse, because depending on your society, you could become a murderer. What would happen if you were born and raised in Nazi Germany? Do you think you would resist? Or would you be part of the Hitler Youth Party like everyone your age was doing? So Stanley Milgram, who was a psychologist in the 60s, asked this question. You guys ever heard of Stanley Milgram? He did a famous experiment with electric shocks. A lot of people have seen this. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you half this video. This was reenacted on a reality TV show called The Heist by Darren Brown. He's an English, uh, you know? Okay, so... But they showed it, I think, also in, in the United States. So he reenacted this experiment. The experiment basically works as this. We're going to give it a setup, and then we'll see half of it. A guy who thinks he's giving electric shocks to another person in another room that he can hear anytime the other guy makes a mistake. And they, want, they think that they're testing punishment and learning. And every time the guy makes a mistake, he gives an increasingly severe electric shock. And he has this whole machine in front of him and says at the end, it's 450 volts, lethal, extremely dangerous. And there's a guy in a white lab coat telling him he's continuing the experiment. The question is, will the guy... Who's really, he's not getting any shot. He doesn't know that. Is he going to stop and stand up to the lab technician and say, I can't be part of this? Or really continue because the whole social pressure is pushing him to, to continue? You get it? You're watching a little bit of this. He is for the heist, so we can
staple. The options are diet, jar, balcony, bowl. Learner doesn't answer in a reasonable time, say four to five seconds, and you have to treat the answer as wrong and follow that procedure. Did you hear that, Learner? Steady response, man, come on. What a guess? <sighs> Please continue. 345 volts, if you're still with me, I'm sorry. I can't do this, honestly. Can we stop this Because I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. That's fine. I'm not going to do this. Incorrect. 405 volts. You have to succumb to social conditioning. If the social pressure is so great and you're not willing to stand up and think for yourself, that given the time and place, you can become a murderer. If you're just comfortable in staying in your box, if your box is Nazi Germany, then the majority of people became murderers and you will likely become one too. That is a scary thought. That should scare you. The only guarantee you have 
And you wouldn't do that is that you are someone who thinks, you question, you understand, you don't settle for being inside your box. That applies to every human being. If you don't do that, then you're not even really a human being. You're not thinking. You're not making decisions. You're just like an animal going along with the masses. We're clear? This is called social conditioning. That's one kind of conviction. It's not valid because it has nothing to do with what the truth is. It's just an accident. So if you're going to get outside the box, how should you determine your convictions? What should they be based on? What should they be based on? We're going to look at four different kinds of convictions. We just looked at one. This was called social conditioning. There's another one. You guys remember? You know the expression, blind faith? What's blind faith? Who can, you, who can give an example of someone who takes a leap of faith? Who's an example of someone who does that? The terrorist is more social condition. She was raised to think that way. Blind faith, you're not raised to think that way. You make a decision later in life to take the leap. Right? What's the example of a leap of faith? Here we are. I'll give you two examples. <coughs> Let's say you're desperate for money. You want to go to Switzerland on a ski trip to remain money. You need three thousand dollars back. You want to take all your savings and invest it in Bitcoin. Because someone's telling you, you know what? This is hot. I guarantee it. You're gonna you're gonna make a killing. You gonna do it? If you research it, then it will be blind faith. Okay, I don't know. Anyone who's researching understands anything about what Bitcoin really is, right? So why do people why are a lot of people doing it? People are making money. Does that mean that you should do it? It's very tempting. Right? Do you know for sure that you're gonna, it's a guarantee that you're going to triple your money? No. But if you're so desperate for money, you'll make that leap. What will your father tell you to do? Okay. It's sounding okay. You know it's about. Is this a wise investor? He's using his mind. You're using your emotions. Why do we? Christians, why born again Christians take a leap of faith, right? Why? Why would someone choose to make that, that kind of leap and just accept the Ashkel and the Why? Why? What are they getting out of making that leap? The, the leap of faith could go either way. Right? That's true. So why are they leaping in? Why do they, what's compelling them to take that leap? Because they know if they don't take that leap, it will end up ultimately the worse. Why? How? Because they know that they're sick of the old, but they're disenchanted, disillusioned, disillusioned. Okay, well, yeah, so now flip it around. So they're disenchanted, disillusioned, they're depressed, they're unhappy. They think this will give them meaning, com uh, community, they'll be saved. They're getting promised paradise on a planet. All they have to do is believe. They don't even do anything, right? So they're getting, there's an emotional need that this leap is giving them. So what's it based on? Nothing but feeling, emotion. Now, what's wrong with making a decision based on feeling and emotion? Transient. What's that? It's transient. It's transient. You have no guarantee how you're going to feel tomorrow. What are you going to do when tomorrow, when the feeling goes? Your whole basis is wiped <coughs> away. What's the other problem with it? What's the other problem making your conviction based strictly on emotion? You're biased. And even here, so much you're biased, you have no idea if it's real. <coughs> it has nothing to do with reality. It's just giving some kind of emotional need. But you don't know if it's true. That's how people get caught in, in cults. You just wish it's true. It doesn't mean it is true. So blind faith and soul conditioning, what they both have in common, neither one tells you what reality or truth is. Does that make sense? So how should you make your decision? What should your decision be based on? 
if it's not based on just your society, it's not based just on your emotion, what should it be based on? Facts. Why? Because what does facts, information, evidence give you? You're seeing reality now. You're aiming to find the truth. What does Judaism demand? Is Judaism a religion based on blind faith or what we'll call knowledge? Facts. Knowledge. What do you guys say? What are you guys thinking? A little bit of both. Why is it a little bit of both? Because at the end of the day, every single religion requires some leap of faith. You can never know for a fact that we're, what we believe is true 100%. Okay. Did anyone disagree with them? No, based on uh, the paradigm of evidence. Okay. And how, where do you, show me, tell me what the Torah itself demands us to have. Mm. Yeah. What's that? No. Knowledge. Where does it say that? I see. Where does it say that? No. Okay. Yeah. Well, the first of the series of English. First of the Ten Commandments. What's the first mitzvah? From the Rambam's order. What's the very first mitzvah? What does the Rambam open start the whole mission Torah with? That you have laid down and shall have an obligation to know there's a God, right? Da'at is the Hebrew word, right? To know there's a God. What does it mean to know? What does that mean? That you have to have it based on reason, intellect. How do you know it's real? Don't just assume it. Don't just hope it's true. Don't just believe it because it's how you were raised. You've got to do more than that. You have to actually know it. See that it's real. There's another word that's thrown around. What's the other word? Knowledge, dot, is to believe. Right? What would that be in Hebrew? Amuna. Now, these terms are thrown around. Amuna and and dot. You have to define these terms. And any safer you use, the author might be using it differently. Like Derek Hashem. You guys ever learned Derek Hashem? The first line of Derek Hashem, what does he say? Every Jew has to believe and know, you know, that there is a, a first cause, and then he defines God. He says both, the Amin Leida. The Rambam says Leida, but in Sefer Mitzvah he uses the word Lamin, to believe. What's the difference between belief and knowledge? You want to take a stab at it? We're going to give you two answers, yeah. The belief is an idea based on, like, evidence that it's not like, but it could be wrong, right? And then... Um, and then knowledge is something based on empirical evidence. Okay, very good. What's your name? Yaakov. You guys hear what Yaakov said? Okay, this is the first answer. Very good. And this, before we I repeat what Yaakov said, it answers a different question. Who did Hashem give the mitzvah to know there's a God to? There's a problem. There's a famous question that was shown in Mass. And Torah the Ramban doesn't include as one of the mitzvahs. You're saying we want to say to it was Jews at heart and stood at heart Sina, right? What's the problem with saying that the mitzvah was to them? What's that? Okay, well it was also to us, but 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 what's the bigger problem saying it's to the Jews at heart? Well, they saw it. They saw it, they already know. You don't need to give them a command. They know there's a God. Because I didn't tell anyone to sit down. You're sitting. So maybe it's to you, to the future generations of Jews who don't know there's a God. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with saying the mitzvah is for Jews who don't know there's a God? Right? In their eyes, it's not a mitzvah. Because there's only a mitzvah if you first believe there's a commander. They don't believe there's a God. It's very nice, it says in the book, believe in a God. I don't listen to that. So who's the mitzvah for? It's either redundant or irrelevant. Which is why some, before she don't count the mitzvah of Leida as one of the, the Tariq mitzvahs. It's like a prerequisite. But when the Rambam is, so who's the mitzvah for? Yaakov's explanation answers it. Why? Because you can have a Jew who believes there's a God. What's belief? How much evidence do you need to have? And this gets to, what's his name? Yeah. Yaakov, this gets to addressing your issue. How sure can you know? How much evidence do you need to have before you're going to start observing the Torah? 
you know, a, a secular guy comes to Isha Tov. At some point, he decides, I'm going to keep, I'm going to stop smoking Shabbos or not. At what point does he make that decision? And he wants to smoke. <coughs> How much evidence does he have to have? If you want to be rational about it, what are you going to say? If knowledge is a continuum, this is 100% total clarity. This is zero. What point does it make sense for him to stop smoking on Shabbos? What? A hundred? Only if he knows 100% should he stop smoking Shabbos? Why does it... Do you guys agree with this? No. Why? What's wrong with that? Don't mean to pick on you. What's wrong with that? Because... Okay, but what's why is that irrational? That you want to wait for 100 knowledge before you're going to do it. Why is that really irrational? Once you get beyond a reasonable doubt, then I... Then you hear what Yaakov say? Once you're on 51%, it's irrational to, de- to deny where the majority evidence lies. So if you're, according to you, you're 98%. I'm going to deny the 98% of evidence that is pushing down on me, and I'm going to rely on the 2%. That is called the leap of faith. That's irrational, right? That is what many people do. People who don't want to shake their, their attitude. You know, people who basically want to deny God. They'll, no, 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 I'm not listening. But if you're being strictly rational, once you have 51%, the scales tip one way, then go where the evidence lies. Now, do you have questions at that point? Of course. Doubts? Big ones. In fact, you're really not even sure. You're totally confused. Right? And that could be some of you guys, you know? Yeah, you know, I learned this, I learned that. I basically, oh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I have a question. Well, then I you know. But you believe. You have a Muna. What's the mitzvah? Hashem is saying, don't settle for a Muna. Get to Da'at. Knowledge is just climbing the ladder where you're more secure in knowing what you're believing is actually true. 80, 90, whatever it is. 100%, you need to be prophecy to get to 100%. But we make life or death decisions on way less than 100%. You're going to choose your marry on way less. As much as you can know that you got your five fingers, you can know that there's a God. But so, the mitzvah is to people who know there's a believe in God, Hashem is saying don't settle for that. Deal with your question. Be honest. And examine the, the evidence and get confidence that what you believe in is really true. That's answer number one. Answer number two, what does dot really mean? This Hebrew word dot, where is it, else is it used in one other connotation? Something that we probably shouldn't really be talking about? Right. Relations with your wife. Adam knew Chava and she could see the word the kind. That's a bit weird, no? What does dot, knowing something, have to do with intimacy? What's the connection? What's that? I said it's the purest way of knowing. It's the purest, what what does that mean? I mean, how does that apply? What is knowledge? How does the intimacy reflect on knowledge? What's, yeah? And it's a, the deepest kind of connection. Dot, real dot, is not just intellectual. It's taking what we know and assimilating it. The Hashavos Allah It's living with your intellect. That is the mitzvah to know there's a God. I'll give an example. I mean, Rodessa speaks about this. You guys, you look at Mabata and Rodessa, you see through all this entire subject. It's worth reading, but you're going to do it. You're going to do it in its entirety. Otherwise, it'll confuse you. But he says, why do people smoke? It's because they don't know smoking is dangerous. Is that why they don't they smoke? Everyone knows smoking kills you, right? So a guy goes to the hospital with cancer ward. He sees people dying from smoking. Do you think he's going to have a cigarette for the first five minutes in the hospital? No. What changed? What changed? Did anything intellectually change? No, he knew before. What changed? What he knows in his mind is a reality now. He feels it. He sees it. He closed the gap between his mind and his heart. Rodesto says the distance between your mind and heart is greater than the distance between the earth and the moon. You can believe in God. And moon, according to this explanation, it's intellect. You can have total intellectual clarity 
and still live life like God's not part of it. That it's an abstraction. It's distant. And that's where people have crisis in the moment. You can believe in God, but the push comes to shove. You know, my mother is sick. Do I really rely that Shem is going to heal her? Do I really feel that Shem is going to be my Rishar? That he's going to be my Parnassa? That is in the arena of death. It's taking what you know in your mind and putting it in your heart. And it's like what, what Yaakov said before. You need both mind and heart. Feelings are important. That's what means have a relationship with God. But the feelings are being led by your mind. You first have to know what you believe is true. Then get your emotions involved. Does that make sense? You guys got that? So there's four different kinds of convictions. Social conditioning, blind faith, which are invalid. Then there's amuna and doubt. Judaism, and I think it's the only religion that I know of, demands that you build it on intellect. Because Judaism is true. That's why they talk about the demand of it. God's not afraid of you questioning. He wants, he doesn't want you to be a robot. He wants you to understand this is reality. Because otherwise, if you talk about it, how can you have a relationship with Hashem? You have to know it's real. Right? And it's only if you know it's real that you can really have confidence. I can give this over to my children. And I can share it with other people. Right? But now, time is it? Got the time? Okay. But it's not so simple. Let's say <coughs> you have four blind men who encounter an elephant. One blind man holds the trunk of the knees as a hose. One guy grabs the legs as a tree trunk. One guy the tail thinks it's a whip. Another guy walks on the sun elephant and thinks it's a wall. They go to the wise man, and the wise man says, All four of you are right. And what's the moral of the story? Is the moral of the story truth is relative? Four different perspectives are all right? Is that the moral of the story? What's that? Now, why is that not the moral of the story? Is truth relative in the story? No, why? Well, what's the truth? It's an elephant. It's an elephant. There's one single absolute reality here. It's an elephant. But what's the difficulty? Can we see the elephant? Everyone's blind. We don't ever see everything. So what should they do? What's the mistake that they're making? Oh. And, and instead, what's the mistake they're doing? Why are they all getting the wrong answer? Why are they all wrong? Because they're all relying on one piece of the information. They're taking one part and saying, oh, I know it all. And that is by necessity a distortion of the truth. And so they should do what the Yaakov was saying. Sit around the table, join forces, share your information, <coughs> and then you're going to come to see this bigger picture. This is an animal, not a table. What kind of animal? They're going to figure out this thing is an elephant. So what's the moral of the story? If you want to see the truth, you can't ever think you know it all. You've got to get all the information. Don't close yourself off. And what is the word for truth in Hebrew? And so what's you need about emet? Al men taf, al the beginning, men the middle, taf the last. Why? Because emet is a compass of the whole. It's seeing the whole picture. So you've got it for you the rest of your life have the humility. I don't know everything. And it doesn't mean that you don't think and make distinctions and say this is false. Of course you do. But once even within Torah, don't think that you know it all. But what happens? The blind man thinks it's a hose. He goes and he writes a best-selling book, The Seven Secrets of Hose. He's become famous and multi-millionaire. You know, he's on the talk show circuit. It's huge, right? One end is knock on the door. It's another blind man. He says, I'm used to you. It's not a hose. You're wrong. It's a trunk. How does Mr. Hose react? Slams the door on his face, right? Why? Why does he slam the door on his face? Because he knows it's a house. But then he's, but this blind, other blind man is giving him now new information that is shaking his world. And he's realizing, oh my God, I'm wrong. My whole career, my reputation, I've got to publicly admit I blew it. That makes you very uncomfortable, doesn't it? He can't handle the truth. And he shuts the door in guy's face. This is called cognitive dissonance. When the reality that's staring at us makes us uncomfortable and we don't want to deal. So we put down a defense mechanism. We throw up a wall. And we shut out the information. 
We are not computers that just dispassionately, objectively assess information and spit out the truth. We have emotion. We have bias. Right? So I mentioned bias before. And that colors the way we view things. And if we're so steeped in our bias, it might prevent us from seeing the truth. And that's part of the tricky thing. You know, you have guys coming to Asia Torah. And you know, how do you think they're feeling? Listen to this rabbi who's about to show them that God is real and gave the Torah. What do you think is going on in his mind? What, why is he freaking out? Why do you think he's freaking out? Yeah. Okay, one, I got a minute long. And what's even more immediate than that? Oh my God, I got to change my life. I got to give up girl. Drunk. Friday night. Right? I'm about to, but I was not raised religious. You know what it was for me? I, I, the only religious people I saw growing up were the Christian ministers on TV. You know, Sunday morning. I, I believe in the Lord. You know, those like, uh, those Bible bumping guys. So I thought, you believe in God? You're like that. You're an idiot. You've got to be a stupid person to believe in God. It's the atheistic compliment. They're the smart ones. So I had to overcome my whole gut that was saying, I'm not stupid to believe in God. You know, that was my personal life. Everyone's got them. We all have got biases, right? Let's say someone, someone's going to come and show you, you know what? I'm going to show you that you should go to university and you should stay cold for the rest of your life. And you should be like, you want to hear that so easily? You know, you're not going to be freaking out? So when you freak out, that walks you from seeing the truth. Then we're back to square one. How do you see the truth? How do you get outside your box? You're the difficulty? How do we overcome our bias? How do we come overcome our fear when we hear something that's going to make us uncomfortable or might make us change? How do we do that? What are you going to say? Yeah. You don't know? Come on. You can bet you give me one good answer right now. What, you, what do you have to do? What did you say? What, is it, what do you mean by that? First, I'm not sure what you mean, but, but I'm, I'm going to take what you're saying and probably make it look what I want to say. But it's like, what do you, to rationalize fears, you've got to understand what are your fears, right? That changes everything. Is that what you meant? You're absolutely right. That's the first thing you want to do. Most people, when they're freaking out, do they know why they're freaking out? No. It's all internal. They're like, they're confused. Stop. Understand why am I freaking out? What's scaring me? What's my fear? What does that do? Why does it change everything? Because if you can concretize, articulate it, then you can wrestle with it. You can ask yourself, does this make sense? Does it make sense that we have to be stupid or not? No. That's a seven-year-old's view of the world. Most of our fears are based on seven-year-old views of the world. <coughs> so you can intellectually grapple with it and then rise above it. But you don't stand a chance unless you can first articulate it. So first, get honest. Look inside. Have a mentor. Have a rabbi. Have a friend. Because they can see your bodies that you can't see. And most importantly, you've got to be committed to seeing the truth. Have the humility and be a true seeker. Because you always have to know, truth is always in your best interest. That's is always best for you. And no matter how confused you are, you're, you're the Shama, and the Gesha says, that can always point you to true love, what truth really is. Thank you very much. Any questions? I think that's it right there. What's up? One question. One question. You're the first one to put your hands. You're it. Any questions? Yes. Very easy. Because, it, because there's a guy in the white lab coat that's sitting over here telling him he's continuing to continue. Who cares? Why would you shoot him? Shoot him. Why do you sit there? Shoot him. It's like this. So Why do you there? Why there to sit to that seat? I know. So, but, that, but this is all of us. We crazy. have social pressure. You know? <laughs> There's a social pressure. I like the blue shirts. I don't know when you see react, you know? But you know, do you feel comfortable wearing a blue shirt? I'm going to go to Sometimes it's smart. The smart sometimes the smart thing to do is to go along with social pressure. You can make that decision. You know, when I moved back to Israel, I did give up. I did decided to give up my non white shirts. It was a decision. But that wasn't, I wasn't going along with social pressure. I decided to do that. But social pressure affects all of us. Because we want to fit in. You don't want to look stupid. You don't want to, like, you know, have a confidence. Right? You don't, you, you, 
You're not going to get all my social pressure? No, a little, yes, of course. But so just, but so when, when, when they came to speak to this guy and told him, we're going to do an experiment and we're going to torture a guy, you're going to go... Oh, no, 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 so he, he didn't realize. First of all, why did he sign up into the video? That's the question. Oh, okay. You're, you're lacking information. This was part of a whole show where they were actually going to do a, a heist. <laughs> he was trying to find people to go on a robbery. That's actually, and he was testing people. He's the only one of the people who, who would go along with authority. So you, they knew they would be part of the whole TV show. That, that's what was happening. Other people, the initial experiment, they got paid to run experiments and options. But they didn't know, they didn't know what they were going to do, and they would just go along. But then they were in this, in this uh, dilemma. Do I back out or not? Okay, thanks. So, any other questions?